Well, hello everyone and welcome to From the Woods today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm here with my co-host Billy Thomas. We both work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources and we have a really great show coming up for you today. Yeah, no doubt, Renee. I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, you know, it's August 12th here in Kentucky, another beautiful day in the state, and um, we've got three great presenters. We're going to be continuing the um, Forestry 101 series. We've got part three coming up with Dr. Jacob Muller. Um, he's going to be our lead off segment. And then we're going to have a um, the snake ID of the week um, followed up by the tree ID of the week. So we'll encourage you all to interact with us via the chat pod. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, welcome. We're glad to have you with us. Please put comments and um, you can put your questions in the comment section there and we'll get to those as quickly as possible but again we're just really thankful to have you all with us on this gorgeous day here in Kentucky and Renee I'm excited about this show yeah definitely and always if you are on Facebook remember to share and like us and comment um, so we can you always can turn our notifications on so that you always know when we're on live but where we do this every Wednesday at 11 o'clock so if you're joining us first for the first time we greatly appreciate you being on so let's get started with today's show yeah. Hey, Jacob, if you can pull up your video, we'd like to chat with you for a second about this um, upcoming segment. Um, so, Jacob, just to um, remind our viewers that, you know, this is your third part in this Forestry 101 series. Uh, maybe give them a, a, a kind of a rehash a little bit of the first two parts and, and introduce this one coming up. Sure. Yeah. So, like Billy said, this is the third part. Um, and we've kind of set the stage for building up and, and thinking about why we manage forests and, and reasons why it's important uh, to actively manage our forests. And uh, with this part, we're actually kind of taking the next step and uh, talking about engaging with a natural resource professional, uh, some things to think about uh, with your own woodland or uh, if you're helping somebody manage their woodland and uh, thinking about some of the questions to ask and uh, some opportunities that there might be uh, for managing uh, your forests or woodland. You know, one of the th great things about here in Kentucky, Jacob, we've got so much help available for folks that are interested in engaging with their woodlands and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But, um, you know, I guess we could go ahead and show um, Jacob's segment. Most woodland owners enjoy their woods, but haven't really thought about it from a management perspective. Uh, for some, this is a family property uh, that they valued and visited as a child, uh, where, or for some others, it's a place where we go hunt annually or fish, uh, and it doesn't really seem like something that needs to be managed. However, once we start having a conversation uh, about wildlife, uh, invasive species, insect problems, or forest uh, products, or what we can derive uh, from a woodland, uh, most of us realize that it would benefit uh, uh, having some help from a professional, a natural resource professional, and oftentimes that is a forester. So we're lucky here in Kentucky, uh, in this state where we have a wide variety of options uh, to help us with our management planning. Uh, KDF, or the Kentucky Division of Forestry, has foresters. Uh, there are a number of uh, private and consulting foresters in the state uh, that can help you with the management of your, your woodland. So when you contact a forester to come help, uh, you should be ready to answer a few basic questions about uh, your property. Uh, even just some basic information, where you're located, what county you're in, the size uh, of, your, of your woodland, uh, and your property for that matter. And so if you just have some basic information that can go uh, help you go a long way uh, in, in getting a forester to, to help uh, get ready or prepare for the visit. In your first conversation with a forester, uh, it would be really helpful to them uh, if, if you thought about uh, some questions and had answers uh, to these questions ahead of time. And so certain simple questions like, uh, why do you own the property? Uh, what activities have you done on the property, property or do you enjoy doing on the property, such as hunting, fishing, uh, wildlife watching, uh, hiking, uh, uh, or, or cutting um, uh, firewood or some sort of forest product? Uh, have you done any work in the past? Uh, have you planted trees? Uh, have you built any trails or removed any invasive plants? Uh, was there a specific reason why uh, 
you uh, thought about managing your forest or consulting with a forester, uh, do you have any specific concerns, whether it's forest health related, invasive species related, or something that you feel that's a little bit outside of uh, the context of what you, what you can do on your own? Uh, the forester will likely schedule a visit to come out and visit your, your woodland or your forest. Uh, and oftentimes it helps uh, if you're there and walk through the forest uh, with, with the, the forester and can uh, articulate specific needs uh, and desires for that, for that uh, specific woodland. Forester will typically provide you with some sort of plan or an action plan uh, or management plan uh, outlining different activities uh, for your woods. Uh, they will uh, also include uh, resources uh, that you talked about uh, or they noticed uh, would be helpful for your woodlands uh, with, with your uh, interests uh, in mind. Uh, they might also include some educational pieces for you uh, or a list of uh, resource professionals, uh, their natural resource uh, professionals, foresters, um, uh, or anybody that can help um, uh, with, with uh, implementing your management uh, plans. Uh, this can also include some cost share options for you to help, uh, help you with the list of things uh, in this management or action plan. So maintaining the health on your land uh, can really have a significant effect on uh, the forest health, uh, uh, the water, the wildlife uh, that uh, choose to live on, live on your land. And this includes uh, increasing and improving uh, wildlife habitat. Uh, profiting from your land through timber harvesting or hunting leases uh, is a common uh, goal for a number of landowners. Uh, and so thinking about how we manage our forests now can improve uh, those resources in the future. And protecting just the legacy of this land and passing it down to uh, our kids and the next generation. So thinking about these activities that you'd like to do related to your goals is, is really so important. So if you have goals around wildlife on your land, uh, there might be some activities uh, that you would be um, interested uh, in doing. Perhaps you like uh, to watch birds and enjoy uh, going out and watching and listening uh, to different bird calls. Uh, but you want to create different places uh, on your land uh, to see birds. You might want to create different openings like meadows and have uh, more water sources uh, in your woodland. Or maybe you'd like to create some more uh, trails for you to walk through so you can actually view uh, a lot of the wildlife. And so we've got uh, this recreation and wildlife kind of intersecting with our goals. And so uh, record these activities uh, and plan and share them uh, when you meet with your forester so they have a better idea of what you want to do with that land. Uh, that you will uh, take the information that they provided you uh, and, and uh, think about how that can help create an overall management uh, plan and framework uh, for your own woodland uh, to improve forest health, help you meet your management objectives, uh, whether that's improving wildlife habitat, uh, improving timber resources, or other forest or non-timber forest products uh, in your land. And so thinking about this collectively, it's really uh, this, this great opportunity for you to take action uh, and actively manage uh, your forest. We've been talking about active management being so important and passive management being kind of this absence from, from any sort of management on the land. And we're encouraging even people who don't live in their particular woodland that they own to think about actively managing uh, their forest and their woodland uh, for overall forest health and improve uh, your forest uh, for decades and centuries into the future. The actions that we take now can have significant implications, uh, and if we take um, sustainable management practices, uh, those implications can be uh, a very healthy uh, and resilient forest uh, long into the future.
uh, but the forester is there to help. Uh, they want to help you actively manage your forest. Uh, and so this shouldn't be uh, in sort, any sort of intimidating or daunting experience. Uh, with, with a little bit of prep, uh, thinking about your land, uh, you can really articulate your goals to the forester and they can help you uh, manage your, your forest. Uh, they're there to help you think about your management uh, and help you actually achieve your goals. And so I hope this was helpful. Uh, please reach out uh, to the Kentucky Division of Forestry uh, or any uh, consulting uh, uh, forester to help you think about managing your forest. That was a great video um, that Jacob gave us and Jacob if you want to put your camera back on we greatly appreciate uh, you doing that for us and doing that series um, so people can kind of know what what to do for Forestry 101 but um, just like every show every week if you all have a chat a question that you want to ask uh, just type it in the chat pod no matter when it is even if it's after the segment we can get Jacob back on but one thing I want to ask you Jacob in Kentucky where do you go about finding a forester? Sure I think that's kind of the first barrier that um, kind of uh, it kind of discourages people from really managing their forest because they don't really know uh, where to look but there's so many online uh, resources uh, available uh, from the Kentucky Division of Forestry uh, KDF website uh, to the KACF, the Kentucky Association, Association of Consulting Foresters, so that's kacf.org. Uh, um, and there's uh, a number of resources to help uh, connect you with, um, with a forester. And uh, though we at uh, UK Extension uh, aren't uh, uh, consultant foresters. Uh, if you do still have questions, definitely reach, reach out and we can uh, help answer questions and, and maybe connect you with, with those resources. Yeah. So getting a consultant forester is very uh, something that you would really want to do or some kind of some, somebody to help you out so you know more. Uh, Billy, I know you you've tell people this all the time to, to get help with anything they're doing with their woodlands. Yeah, no doubt, Renee. Um, like I mentioned earlier before Jacob's segment, um, we are fortunate here in Kentucky to have a number of foresters available to work with landowners. And, um, you know, he mentioned the Division of Forestry, so they have regional offices spread out across Kentucky and they have foresters assigned to each county. So you have a forester assigned to your county where your property is located. And the consultant foresters, they work across the state. We have over 20 consulting foresters that are members of the Kentucky Association of Consulting Foresters here in the state. And um, that's a group we work with um, regularly on doing educational programming. Um, so that's a great resource. And then you also find some of those folks on the technical service provider list that the Natural Resources Conservation Service um, maintains. Um, I would encourage folks, we're gonna be having all of these folks on our 2020 um, Kentucky Woodland Owner Short Course. So you can learn more about each of these groups if you'll check that out. On September 17th, we're gonna be having a partners webinar about um, each of these partners and what they do. So it's an opportunity for you to really kind of learn more. But, um, you know, Jacob, I wanted to comment on your video. One of the things I really appreciated um, that you kind of were driving home there is how the management of the force is really driven by the objectives of the landowners and, and being able to think through those objectives before you meet with the forester um, really can kind of prepare that forester to give you recommendations that will really help you achieve your goals. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the key thing is for us to really just be thinking about uh, ultimately what our goals are and that's kind of what the forester is there to help you achieve those goals and, and tell you if they're realistic or not. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. You know, you may want to do something on your property, but it may, you may not have the soils or the landscape or, you know, or whatever you need there to do that. So, um, yeah, making it realistic is really important for sure. And Jacob, we did have a question about how long does it typically take to get a plan from the initial field visit? Uh, that's a good question. And I, I can't say a specific time um, Billy might have 
Yeah, yeah I, would, I would say, Jacob, on that, it's going to vary a little bit where you're located, right? Um, if it depend, and it also depends on who you're working with. So if you are in a, um, a in one part of the state where they've got a backlog, it may take a little bit longer. It may be a few months um, uh, before they can even get to you to develop that plan. But I say once they visit you, you're probably within a few weeks of getting that plan. They have to go back and do some work um, to prepare that plan for you. I would say um, that, you know, if you're willing to pay for a management plan, you may be able to get it a bit quicker um, through a consulting forester. They may be able to kind of prioritize that. Um, but if you're looking for a, a free plan that the Kentucky Division of Forestry um, provides, then you'll have to kind of get on their wait list. And again, that's going to vary based where you're at in the state. Um, I would say that if, um, you know, if the wait's too long there and, and you don't have the resources to pay a consultant right out to develop a plan for you, there is another program available through the Natural Resources Conservation Service that will actually pay a technical service provider to develop a plan for you. Um, so if you all have got further questions about that, we could talk about that. But um, NRCS will be talking a little bit about that on um, September 17th as well. So how often should they update their forestry plan? Uh, that's a good question. And I think if, if you're developing a very thoughtful, robust forestry uh, plan, uh, that's meant to extend years and decades uh, into the future, uh, but we know forests aren't static systems, they're dynamic and they change, and uh, it's so important to interact with, with the woodland and uh, do some monitoring of that woodland. And uh, in fact, in the Woodland Owner Short Course, we're going to talk about adaptive uh, management and the whole idea of that is understanding that there's a lot of uncertainty in how forests will respond in the future and respond to our management and so uh, being able to kind of pivot and adjust and tweak our management plans to ultimately meet our objectives is really uh, the key to that and so uh, it's again not a, there's no good answer and um, but uh, ultimately a forest plan should uh, think about lasting you decades into the future and how you're thinking yeah. about you know, Jacob, one thing I kind of think a little bit about that plan, you know, that plan, if you just take that plan and you put it on your shelf, it really is not going to do you much good. It needs to be a living document. You need to kind of, like you said, interact not only with your woodland, but with that plan. Um, you can amend it as, as conditions change. So if some big change happens on your forest, like Jacob was saying, that might be a time you need to revisit the plan and make some adjustments from there. But I would much rather see a dog-eared, coffee-stained, um, kind of ripped uh, management plan than one that's pristine and looks like it's never been opened because really it's not going to do you a lot of good if you're not re referring to it and kind of following those guidelines. Because a lot of things could change, right? You could have, you know, some kind of EAB infestation or what have you, and then things may change. Um, you know, do people change their uh, thoughts on how they want to handle their, their woodlands? Something that you don't need to just stick it up on a shelf and decide, well, I'm not going to do anything else with that because your needs might change as well. So um, Eric Gracie said that certification requires to, to be updated at least every 10 years. So if you're in uh, some kind of certification program, then you definitely have to get that updated. Well, you know, and I'll mention too, um, and I think we've probably said that before on this show, but another great benefit of that plan is that really can kind of set you up for being eligible for some of this financial assistance. Um, a lot of times they want to see a management plan in place um, of what you're going to do, a well thought out plan and kind of, and they want those recommendations to be tied to that resource and that landowner's objective. So once those things are in place, that opens the door for you to be eligible for additional support out there. And it's just really smart to have that plan because it's really your roadmap for your Forest, you know, how you're going to kind of achieve your objectives in the long term. All right. Well, it looks like that's all the questions we have right now. Thank you, Jacob, for doing that video. It was yeah. so great. And we look forward to the rest of your series. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Ja Jacob, we're so glad to have you on the team and, um, and all your contributions. Thank you so much. Definitely. All right. Moving on. Um, yeah. So we have switch our gears little. switch gears a little bit from fours to snakes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this is an interesting one we're going to be having. Um, I think we see Matt Springer on. I know he's out traveling the roads of Kentucky right now. So maybe he's pulled over in a rest stop somewhere. Um, but Matt, I don't know if you're available to come on with us. Um, if you are, great. And if not, I understand you are <laughs> there he is. Um, out there serving the citizens of Kentucky. Thank you so much. Uh, 
anything, I'm anything good. Yeah, I was gonna say anything you want to say before we uh, play your um, segment here. Um, no, other than this is probably um, an example of one of our more common snakes that we see in Kentucky. It's one I get a lot of pictures of. Um, it's it's one that has a interesting story related to its name. Uh, so uh, that's kind of all I got for it. I, I did find a rest stop and pulled off so I can do this safely. Uh, that's why I said timing is good because I just pulled off and parked like two seconds ago. <laughs> Great. Well, we appreciate you doing it. We know you're out in the trenches doing things and we greatly appreciate you taking your time to, to answer some questions if there are any about the snake. I'm glad to be here. All right. Well, thanks, man. I'm going to go ahead and play your segment here. And Good morning. This is Dr. Matt Springer with the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources here at University of Kentucky. And we're going to do our snake ID of the week segment. As always, I want to start off by highlighting our wonderful snake identification website, which is a great resource for you. And it can be found at kysnakes.uky.edu. Let's get going with our submission for the week. Now, this picture was submitted about a week ago from Montgomery County, and this guy was actually found indoors, uh, not necessarily uh, the place you always expect to see a snake, and sometimes it gets you, it catches you by surprise and maybe makes you jump back a little bit, but let's move forward and try to ID this guy. Let's start off by trying to figure out, is it a venomous species or a non-venomous species? So we wanna zoom into that head because that's a great resource we have to do that in Kentucky, especially when we have a picture like this where it's contained and we can and zoom in. Now let's focus on the pupils here. And if you, picture's not the greatest, but you can actually tell it, it has a round pupil as opposed to the vertical pupil, uh, which in Kentucky, that's a great uh, detail to use because all of our venomous species and our native venomous snakes have the vertical pupil as opposed to the rounded. So if it has a rounded pupil in Kentucky, it is a non, or it's, it's a non-venomous species. The other thing we can look at here and see is that this, you know, this is a juvenile snake. It's only about 10 inches long. The head may not be as um, drastic in triangular shape if it was a venomous species. However, this one actually has a more narrow head, which goes along with that rounded pupil. Now, if we want to identify this to species, we kind of need to focus in a little bit more on the patterning on this snake. Now, it, it has um, a very distinct reddish to gray to white-ish pattern. Um, you know, these, the important thing here is that we're gonna need to focus a little bit more on the detail of that pattern if we wanna identify the species. And there's a reason for that, and you'll see in a second here. Now, these are very broad saddles. So they are narrow at the top, and or they're wide at the top and narrow towards the, the belly. They also are more of a saddle as opposed to a rounded circle. And the reason that's, um, important here is there's two species of snake in Kentucky that have pretty similar markings as juveniles uh, to the one that we have pictured here. Now I pulled up another species, there's a picture of a, a snake species that is going to share a similar look to this one. Now the, the picture isn't the greatest in terms of comparison, but it has some details on it that stick out a little bit better. Now the snake that the picture I just pulled up on the right here that coloring on their pattern can actually go from this dark brownish gray to where that, that darker brown actually turns to a red, like to the one to the left. But the picture on the right here, those, sat, those, those brown or red marks on that snake will always be a much smaller banding and more circular in shape. And that's because that species is actually the black racer and it's a juvenile of that. And this snake will, turn completely black when it becomes an adult, as opposed to its counterpart here, which we have pictured, that will maintain a, a much more broader saddle-like appearance on, on those patterns. And that is actually the Eastern milk snake, milk snake, which maintains that color as it gets older. The, the rat snakes, the gray rat snakes, will also sometimes have that appearance, a darker uh, brown appearance and have a similar uh, broader pattern, but it's usually a much darker snake. Uh, as a juvenile, as opposed to the Eastern milk snake, which has a lot of that vibrant red. These guys are one of our really common snakes in Kentucky, found throughout the state. Uh, often, um, they're found around agricultural buildings, barns, uh, and that's actually kind of where their name came from. Uh, dairy producers would see them in their barns with their cows quite often. They thought they were actually attaching themselves to others and feeding off the milk which snakes can't do. They can't process milk. What they were really doing was they were in there trying to help them with some rodent control 
uh, for those rodents that were after the cow feed. So these guys completely harmless, really common, and a quite pleasant appearance uh, if you uh, enjoy snakes. Uh, they're one of our more colorful species in the state. As always, I want to end with uh, some facts and, and tidbits on snakes and make sure that you always identify what snake you're dealing with. And if you can't, give it a wide berth and go around it and leave it alone. It's probably going to try to get away as just as fast as you do. If you want to limit how many snakes are using your areas around your house or garden, you want to reduce shrubby areas in those spaces, keep your grass mode short, and eliminate habitat for rodents, whether that be cover or food, which is what the snakes are usually after looking for. Remember, there's lots of positive benefits to having these guys around. And as always, use that Kentucky Snake website when you need it. And if you can't find what you're looking for, please reach out to us here at the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and we'll help you out. That website's kysnakes.uky.edu. That way you have it one more time. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Well, Matt, we thank you for uh, giving us that snake video and uh, appreciate that you're, you're still on with us. And you know, one thing um, as people are typing in the chat pod some questions for you, um, something I don't think we've ever addressed is what do snakes eat? Well, it depends on what species you're talking about, right? Um, so the melt snake there will eat um, primarily rodents. Uh, they will eat some smaller amphibians and frogs and toads. Um, but, you know, it, it really depends. You know, you, get, you start talking about water snakes and some of them, like the queen snake will eat crayfish as their basically their primary diet. Um, or you start talking about things like your rattlesnakes, um, which will eat squirrels and rabbits and, and mice, uh, some of your larger small mammals. So it, it really depends uh, by the snake. Um, and it ranges from everything from earthworms and small beetles all the way up to rabbits, squirrels, uh, and, you know, chickens even if they're small enough and walk in front of the wrong snake. Yeah, that would make sense, I guess. You did walk in the wrong timing <laughs> for that chicken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, timing is yeah. critical. <laughs> yes. Well, we're not getting any questions on, on this snake, so um, we greatly appreciate you uh, pulling over to the side of the road <laughs> and getting with us. And um, I know you're out there trying to get some food, food plot uh, videos done for us for a couple weeks, so uh, we greatly appreciate all the help and work that you do for the show. Yeah, I'm, I'm about an hour and a half from home, so that's what I'm looking forward to getting to. So <laughs> I'm anxious, but I'm happy I was able to join. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And we'll remind our viewers, if you ever have a snake that you encounter, you got pictures of it, send it in, and we'll get Dr. Sprinker to do a um, an ID for you on that. And it may be featured on the Snake of the Week. So, um, yeah, yes, let us that. know. Actually, we had a question just come in. Um, is it true that you see a non-venomous snake, the venomous snake won't come around? That is not true. Um, a lot of our snakes share spaces quite um, significantly. Uh, and the one that somewhat uh, that applies to are your king snake species will actually eat other snakes. So if you have a, um, a lot of king snakes around, you will probably have less uh, abundance of the other snake species since the king snakes will consume them. Now that's not the only thing that they will consume. They will eat rodents as well, but uh, it's a, always a good sign. If you're a, a afraid of having venomous snakes around, having a king snake around is a good thing. Uh, but otherwise, snakes share spaces uh, quite a bit, as, and it's it, you can't use that as a as a uh, indicator that there aren't things around that you don't want to have around. We got a boo to that answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's why I kind of got tickled Sorry. a second ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, we need to tell them the truth though, Matt, that we need exactly. to know, so. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so can a venomous snake or a non-venomous snake actually kill a venomous snake? Yeah, the king snakes are actually non-venomous, so they are, are very capable of, of swallowing a venomous snake um, generally alive. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That sounds like a future topic show. <laughs> if you want it to be, I guess we can. <laughs> well, it's interesting. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Matt. We greatly appreciate you joining yeah. us. Yeah. yeah. And safe travels, Matt. Thank you. And everyone have a great rest of their day. Thanks. All right. All right. All right. Moving All right. on to tree of the week. Yeah. So th this tree is a pretty cool tree. Um, Laurie's done for us. Um, 
it is um, not the most prominent as far as being in our woods, but it is certainly one of the most valuable. So Laura, you yeah, want to talk about it a little bit? Um, yeah, I was going to say it is a great tree. It is. It's a very valuable hardwood tree. Um, and and I, I would say in Kentucky, the wood itself is probably some of the most valuable. And in, in part because of the great quality and in part because it isn't, um, we're not, a, our forest isn't made up of this tree. Um, it is somewhat common. We see it around the bluegrass quite a bit. Like I was driving out one of the roads, um, country roads the other day, and I'm like, wow, look at all those walnuts all, well, that's what we're doing is black walnut all along the fence line. So, um, but yeah, it's a great tree. So um, I hope you enjoy learning a little bit more about it or adding to your knowledge of it already. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resource Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the black walnut. Black walnut, Jugulans nigra, is one of the most prized and valuable of North American hardwoods. It's also called Eastern black walnut and American walnut. It's a medium to large tree that typically grows 70 to 90 feet tall and two to three feet in diameter, but can grow up to 150 feet tall and up to eight feet in diameter on really good sites. In a forested setting, it develops a straight trunk with a narrow crown. It's a relatively fast growing tree that reaches maturity by about 150 years, but can live up to 250 years. Black walnut is highly valued for its wood as well as its fruit, the walnut, which are enjoyed by wildlife and humans alike. Black walnut is found throughout the eastern United States, from Vermont to Minnesota, south to Florida and Texas, and it is a common tree in Kentucky. It thrives in deep, well-drained, neutral soils that are moist and fertile. It can be found in fields and forest habitats. Black walnut is a shade intolerant species and must have direct sunlight to grow optimally. Black walnut can be confused with butternut or white walnut, also called white walnut, or the tree of heaven at a glance. Black walnut is a deciduous tree with alternately arranged leaves, as you can see in the photo. The leaves are compound, which means each leaf is comprised of numerous leaflets, and with black walnut the leaves are pinnately compound, which means the leaflets are arranged on each side of the leaf's central stalk or rachis. The leaves are large, and they're usually about 12 to 24 inches long, and made up of about 10 to 24 leaflets. The leaves are typically missing a terminal leaflet, or if it's there, it's poorly formed. The leaflets are serrated, and the leaf stem or rachis is stout and pubescent or hairy. Fall color is not particularly showy and leaves drop quickly in the fall. Black walnut is monoecious, meaning a tree has both male and female flowers. The male flowers are single stemmed drooping catkins that are about two and a half to five and a half inches long. The female flowers are on short spikes near the end of the twig. The flowers develop in spring between April and early June, depending on latitude, and they emerge with the leaves. The flowers are wind pollinated. The fruit is an edible nut that's enclosed in a thick semi-flesh round green husk that's about two to two and a half inches in diameter. Inside the husk is a furred hard shell that contains a sweet edible nut or kernel. The fruits are born singly or in groups. The fruit ripens between September and October. The husk typically softens and turns dark brown to black as it ripens, and the fruit drops after the leaves have fallen. Good seed crops are regular, possibly twice in every five years, and large seed crops do not occur until trees are 20 to 30 years old. Black walnut is primarily regenerated from seeds that squirrels have buried and failed to recover. The seeds typically germinate the following spring. Black walnut is a valuable wildlife food due to the nutritious fruit. Walnuts are eaten by a variety of animals, including squirrels, raccoons, bear, and turkeys. The leaves are not considered a great browse species for most wildlife, but they are somewhat palatable to white-tailed deer. The bark of black walnut is brown to dark brown to gray. It is divided by deep, narrow furrows into thin ridges that roughly form a diamond-shaped pattern, particularly on younger stems, as you can see in the photo. Thousand canker disease is a threat to black walnut. It's a disease complex that's native to the western United States, but it's spread east. The disease causes leaf yellowing and wilting, branch dieback, and general decline. And once a tree starts showing symptoms, it may die within three to five years. 
The disease is caused by the combined activity of a fungus, Geosmithia morbida, and the walnut twig beetle, a small beetle native to the southwest. The beetle carries the fungus and spreads it to the walnut as it burrows into the branches to feed and reproduce. The fungus then infects the tissue, destroying the vascular tissue and causing small black lesions called cankers to form at the beetle entry points. Eventually, these cankers merge together and they girdle the branch, which prevents the flow of vital nutrients throughout the tree. The walnut twig beetle has expanded both its geographical and host range over the past two decades, and coupled with the fungus, walnut mortality has occurred throughout the West, including California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. In July 2010, thousand canker disease was first reported east of Knoxville, Tennessee, and um, in Richmond, Virginia in 2011. Black walnut wood is heavy, strong, and highly resistant to shock, as well as being rated resistant to decay. The sapwood is nearly white, while the heartwood is a light brown to dark chocolate brown, often with a purple cast or streak. It's normally straight grained and easily worked with hand tools. When the wood is finished, it has a beautiful, smooth, velvety surface. Figure grain patterns such as curl and crotch and burl are prized for their beauty. The wood is used for lumber and veneer, and fine furniture, interior paneling, gun stocks, and specialty products are made from the wood. The nuts provide food for wildlife and humans and can be used in baked items, candy, or ice cream. Black walnuts are not as readily available as English walnuts, which is the tree the bulk of our food grade walnuts come from. The ground shells provide special products including nut shell, blaster, which was used to clean airplane pistons during World War II. The ground shells are used today to make products to clean jet engines. They're used as a filler in dynamite and as a filter agent for scrubbers and smokestacks. The national champion black walnut is in Westmoreland, Virginia, and it's 246 inches in circumference, 104 feet tall with a 56-foot crown spread. The Kentucky champion is in Greene County, and it's 205 inches in circumference, 118 feet tall with a 90-foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Tree Register or the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about black walnut. Black walnut is a favorite host tree for mistletoe. Mistletoe is a plant parasite that lives in the tops of trees and takes water and nourishment from its host tree. Black walnut is known to exude from its roots and other plant parts an allelopathic chemical called juglone, which is highly toxic to other plants. In essence, it excludes other plants from growing underneath it. Native Americans used the nuts for food and extracted a black dye from the roots. The black walnut is mentioned in many Native American creation myths. Black walnut's scientific name juglans is from the Latin jovis and glans, which means Jupiter nut, and nigra is Latin for black, referring to the bark. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the black walnut and get opportunity to get out into your woodland, a local park, or your neighborhood and enjoy the beauty and the bounty of the black walnut. Uh, Lori, I know you touched on this a little bit, but we did have a question. Um, are there trees that suffer from being planted near walnuts? I know you touched on that a little bit in your presentation. Right. Yet, um, black walnut is known, it uh, produces juglone, which is an allelopathic chemical. Um, and it's in its leaves and its uh, fruit, stems, roots, and whatnot. So if you have a black walnut growing near a garden or, or you want to plant other things underneath it, it's something to, to consider because a lot of plants don't tolerate that chemical that the black walnut's giving off and they won't grow under them. So, and there are somebody else also, Susan Fox mentioned there are other, we have other nut trees in the state besides our, um, the black walnut. And they also produce um, some allelopathic chemicals in a smaller um, amount than black walnut, but they can also have some allelopathic um, properties too. There's also a question is, is there a treatment for uh, TCD? And I'm going to turn that over to Hello. Dr. Ellen Crocker because um, she is our forest health person and she could talk a little bit more about um, thousand canker disease. Again, it's not here. Um, it's just one of those that, that it is on that, you know, it could be a potential uh, risk, but it's not been found here in Kentucky. So yeah, the nice thing with thousand canker disease is that um, at least right now, and things could 
change in the future. We don't know what the future will bring. Um, in our area, it hasn't seemed to have taken off. So as uh, Lori mentioned, uh, there were some uh, infections in Tennessee and the beetle and the fungus were found in states to our north as well, um, but it didn't really spread and establish. And they're finding that even those trees that were initially infected in Tennessee, you know, haven't really, um, they've recovered. Uh, to some extent. Um, so fortunately, this does not seem like it's going to be the emerald ash borer of walnuts, um, at least in our area. And at least right now, you know, if trees become more stressed and have other issues that could change. Um, and uh, thousand cankers disease is an interesting one because the name is called thousand cankers. Um, so it's not, uh, it's the damage to the tree is caused um, by many, many beetles tunneling. And then when they tunnel, they bring this fungus with them that they're actually eating the fungus. They're kind of like fungus farmers. Um, so just one beetle and one fungus introduction or a small beetle population um, isn't really going to do much. The fungus by itself, um, if it got into the tree, uh, wouldn't kill the tree. It's that repeated introduction, those cankers that all kind of coalesce and will cut off the circulation of the tree. Um, so some things that you can do would mostly be related to keeping those beetle populations down, keeping your trees healthy. But again, I would say that in our area, this is not something that um, you know we've seen before, not something to be tremendously worried about. Um, keep an eye on your trees and their health. Um, you know, there's lots of other things that can go wrong with walnuts, especially when people plant walnut plantations um, that uh, maybe you're off site or not in the perfect site. Um, you can see trees struggle with that. Um, and I see that uh, uh, far more frequently than um, other, other issues. So I'd say this is one case where I can say um, it's a good news story with uh, uh, an insect disease problem on trees. We did have another question about uh, that someone had a mature black walnut that produced 2,500 plus nuts three years ago, but only a few since then. And want to know if that was typical. I don't, do we? It can be, yeah. That? Black walnut's known for having irregular seed crops and with good ones, maybe twice in five years. So um, yeah, you'll see some irregularity. Weather also impacts that since it is a wind pollinated species, you get a lot of rain when you've got that pollen out there and then it's not getting to the to the flower. So that can be an issue too. And we've had some wet springs lately. I know we've had some issues with our oaks and um, and producing acorn crops as well. So um, there was another question I see and Ellen might wanna, um, Susan had a question about any chance a red bud attacked by ambrosia beetles can re recover. If Ellen wants to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's a good question. So a lot of times when we see trees being attacked by ambrosia beetles, um, it's really a sign that there's something else going wrong with the tree. Because there are, you know, there are some invasive um, ambrosia beetles that can attack perfectly healthy trees and are attracted to those. Uh, laurel wilt is an example of that. Um, but many of the ambrosia beetles that are around, I view them as kind of when you have ambrosia beetle problems, it's a sign that there is something wrong with that tree. That tree was really stressed. Those trees were drawn to that, or those beetles were drawn to that stressed tree. Um, so I would consider that in that um, by the time you might be seeing that ambrosia beetle damage, uh, the damage to the tree, the stress in that tree might be beyond saving. And frequently, once you see a, a large amount of ambrosia beetle damage, um, the tree goes, goes downhill pretty rapidly after that. And I see the mention of um, spring freeze. We had a really rough uh, year in terms of weather, and particularly for a um, species that was recently planted in the landscape setting, maybe in a challenging spot, or maybe a non-native species that's not adapted to our weather, even some of the native um, recently planted ones. Um, that could be enough because we had um, the extreme drought last summer. We had the early uh, freeze or the, the freeze before trees went into dormancy in the fall. And then we had those two uh, frosts that were really sudden in the spring. Um, so all of those could have um, stressed your tree. Um, but it, feel free to email uh, with more photos um, or questions if you have them. And um, I can uh, look at them or share with others uh, as appropriate. Again, you can always go to From the Woods Today 
Today.com and um, email us any photos that you might have or suggestions for the show or take a little survey and and let us know what you like and what you don't like about our show and we we greatly appreciate any kind of comments that we can get. Yeah, no doubt. We want this show to be um, a, a service to you all and to help you all with any forestry and wildlife and natural resources issues here in Kentucky. And so, um, yeah, let us know what you want to hear or what, you, what you're seeing out in your, your neck of the woods, if you would, and, um, and we'll try to address that as well. Billy, there was one other question, <clears throat> looks like, that just popped in. Okay. Craig, do you want to answer that? I didn't see it. Let me grab it. Asked, is walnut monoecious? And it is. Yes, yes. It is one of our trees that's monoecious. Okay. All right. Great. So, Billy, moving on to the Woodland Owner Short Course, we wanted to give one last mention of that uh, to try to get people uh, registered for this uh, short course that's going to be totally online this year. Yeah, so, um, you know, we've mentioned it a time or two here on the show, but then um, we have the registration open and all the details and uh, have been worked out. And um, so it is a virtual um, Woodland Owner short course this year. We do have a number of live sessions that will be available so people can kind of um, in engage with those live sessions. And then we'll have some recorded segments as well. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and show you all the web page for that. All right. So this is our, our short course web page. And um, you can learn some information about it, but I just want to kind of uh, highlight a few things to you. It is absolutely free, but you do have to register to receive the links. Um, we do have some limited capacity, so we're uh, making a registration required for this. But again, it's absolutely free to do that. And um, starting next Tuesday on August 18th, um, we have tree identification coming up. And um, Laurie Thomas is going to be leading that. And then we're also going to have that same evening. Um, Ellen Crocker is going to be talking about Are My Woodlands Healthy? Um, so um, we'll enjoy or invite you all to participate in that one as well. And then we keep it rolling on Thursday with um, forced health considerations for woodland owners. Um, with adaptive forest management with um, Jacob Muller. And then we ha you'll see we have um, you know, courses the following week as well. So these next two weeks coming up in August on Tuesdays and Thursday evenings, we invite you to join us. But again, you'll have to register to get the links for that. And then I mentioned earlier, Renee, that we're going to have these partner webinars. So we have been out and we're filming some of these partners and we're going to have some clips about these partners, but we're going to also have a live webinar for all these different partners that are available to help woodland owners here in Kentucky. So you'll learn about all the agencies and organizations that are available um, to assist you in the management and care for your woodlands. And then on September 19th and 26th, we're going to have some virtual tours of state forests. Uh, I was out filming um, Green River State Forest and Penny Rowell State Forest yesterday, and um, we want to show some video segments of that prior to September 19th and 26th. And then the plan is to have you all watch these prior to those um, those uh, meetings on the at 10 a.m. on September 19th and 26th to give you a chance to ask questions about what you saw in those videos. So I really encourage you all to um, and, and sign up and register for this program. Again, it's free. And the great thing about this, we've had problems in the past, Renee, is people might want to go to both our green and gold track. <clears throat> so now the way it's set up, they can do both. So I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging everyone to register and join us. I'm starting next week on um, at seven o'clock. Yeah. And I really think it'll be great for people that, like you said, that have always wanted to attend both and now they actually can. Um, so that'll actually be helpful. And like you said, it's free. All they have to do is go to the uh, web page and uh, register and we ask them a few short questions, not many, and then they'll get the links for the Zoom webinars. So uh, we hope everybody joins us for the Woodland Owner Short Course on those dates. And um, somebody asked if they will be recorded and yes, we will record those. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And I was going to say, Renee, a nice thing about that is if, you, if your timing doesn't work, you have other activities or obligations during those live sessions, we ha will have those recordings available to you very soon thereafter. And again, you're going to have to register to even see those recordings. So um, registration is required to participate this year. And um, Laurie had um, put up a question about CURS credit. Yes, um, Dr. Ellen Crocker is um, setting it up to where our county extension the folks out there that need additional in-service trainings can receive credit for participating and attending this. So um, I would also ask people, if you know of other woodland owners or people that own woodlands here in Kentucky or really across the country, um, uh, please let them know about this opportunity. Again, there's no cost to them. And I think they're gonna get a lot of great information out of it. And with the hope that they can be able to take this and apply it to their own property to make it as healthy and productive as possible. 
definitely a great opportunity for people to be able to learn more about um, helping their woodlands out. No doubt. All right, so we did it again, Renee, another great show. Um, you know, big thanks no. to all of our guests, you know, Jacob Muller continuing our Forestry 101 series. Um, Matt joining us from the road as well as um, uh, uh, virtually and the uh, um, Snake Idea of the Week and Laurie, um, both in person and with your Tree Idea of the Week with the Black Walnut. So thanks again to all of our presenters. A big thanks to all of our viewers out there. Really, we're doing this for you and we're trying to serve you. So let us know um, how we're doing and what we could do better to be a better service to you all. Right. And uh, definitely uh, check in uh, from the woods today.com and we'll have the shows posted there. And you can always uh, click live to watch us live there or watch us via Facebook. If you're watching us via Facebook, we greatly appreciate it. And remember to share us and turn on notifications so that you know when we're on every week. Uh, but again, join us on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock next week. Hope to see you then.